Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. Alice, I do just need to warn you that in this episode, there are going to be some very naughty words. Don't say you weren't warned. Wondery. 2.30pm, December 3rd, 1963. Clapham, London. Bruce Reynolds lowers himself into an armchair and peels open a newspaper. He scans the pages. It's the first time in months that news of the robbery isn't splashed on the front page. He brings a steaming cup of tea to his mouth. His hair is unkempt and he's grown a moustache. Before he can take a sip, Franny's panicked voice calls out from another room. Bruce, come quick! We've been robbed! Reynolds flings the newspaper to one side and bolts through the door. In the flat small bedroom, he sees Franny standing by an open window, the rails of a ladder just visible outside. They've taken my jewellery! He looks at the ransacked dressing table, drawers hanging loose. Reynolds' blood runs cold. He runs to the wardrobe in the corner, digs through a pile of clothes until he feels a pair of suitcases. The money is still safe. From the open window, he hears voices. Franny peers out, then recoils. There's two police officers down there. He hears a voice call up. Your neighbour's called about the break-in. We're coming up. Reynolds's heart leaps in his chest. His face has been on wanted posters up and down the country for the past four months. Police, open up! Franny's face is ashen. She looks at Reynolds with bewildered eyes. Could you come back later when my husband's home? The police officer sounds impatient. Open the door! Reynolds looks at the open window, but he knows he's out of time. He desperately scans the tiny room for a place to hide. He's about to lose everything. His freedom, his money, and worst of all, his family. He hears Franny in the hallway unlock the latch, the sound of the door opening. Then a thought hits him. Fumbling with his belt buckle, he removes his trousers. It's not the time. Then his underwear. He struggles out of his shirt and takes off his glasses, throws his clothes across the room. As the door opens, he braces himself. Entering the room, Franny emits a squeal of shock. Reynolds sees the look of surprise on the officers' faces. For a second, he stands mute, naked, with only his hands shielding his modesty. He prays his plan works. Her husband is away on business. He can't find out I was here. The officers can't meet his eye. One of them coughs to hide his laughter. (laughs) Right you are, sir. Two minutes. Why is this actually from a very camp 70s TV show? As if it worked. Reynolds grabs his clothes and dashes out of the apartment. As he vaults down the stairs, he lets out a shaky laugh. That was too close. He's never felt more vulnerable. He can't take any more risks. It's time to leave the UK, and this time, for good. From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So, Alice, the plan for the great train robbery has been set. Everything's in place. Any thoughts about the plan? I mean, I think I've had more thoughts about the plan than the crew have, to be honest with you. At least I'm looking forward. Number one, I love a gang as much as the next person, but this one's too big. And they don't even all know each other. So there's none of that kind of camaraderie or loyalty that you will want to rely on in times of strife. Then you're going to chuck them all in a big farmhouse together and make them eat tinned fish and barrels of ale or whatever was on the shopping list. Speaking of the farmhouse, they've not picked somewhere thousands of miles away from where they're doing the robbery. It's just round the bloody corner. But actually, the main thing is that they've given themselves half an hour, 30 minutes to pull off the biggest robbery in British history. Yes, as someone who's often late themselves. (laughs) Good point. 
I'm glad you recognise the dire consequences of poor timekeeping. I'll be honest, I'm not sure I would have even made it to the planning meeting. (laughs) Well, despite your many, many reservations, the show must go on. This is episode two, Sitting Ducks. In the aftermath of a shocking crime, people always ask, why? Why would someone do something like that? I'm Candace DeLong, host of the podcast Killer Psyche, where every week I explain the thoughts, motivations, and behaviors of the most violent figures in history. Listen to Killer Psyche on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Four months earlier, August 8th, 1963, 12.30 a.m., Leatherslade Farm, Oxfordshire. Bruce Reynolds adjusts his beret in front of the mirror. An SAS-winged dagger Franny sewed on glints in the light. He listens as the crew prepare the Land Rovers outside, thinks back to a few hours earlier when a neighbouring farmer knocked on the door. Reynolds had said they were decorators. He just hopes he bought it. Oh, God, that was the cliffhanger last time when they were like, it's not goody. Yeah, it was the neighbouring farmer, so they've obviously given him some story. We're just 25 burly guys putting up some flock wallpaper. At midnight. (laughs) He takes a breath checks his watch. It's time. He calls out to his men. Everybody out! Reynolds watches as Goody counts the 16-strong crew into the three Land Rovers. In their army fatigues, they look like a military unit heading into battle. Reynolds maps out the steps in his mind as he climbs into the leading vehicle. At the bridge, the crew will change out of their military uniforms. Then they will rig the signal. Once the train is brought to a standstill, Goody will seize control and separate the engine and money carriage from the rest of the train. Then he will drive it to the bridge, where the Land Rovers will be waiting to take the money away. Reynolds has planned it to a T. All he needs to do is signal to the others when the train is approaching. Will that be a classic? The train's approaching or a code, do we think? Surely the sound of a train approaching. (laughs) When you hear a train approaching, trust those instincts. Reynolds parks on a hill overlooking the track. He presses the button on his walkie. In position. Reynolds has calculated they have just 30 minutes to stop the train, separate the carriages and unload the money before the alarm is raised. But right now, all he can do is wait. He fishes out a Cuban cigar from his tunic, runs it under his nose, inhaling deeply. All for a little celebratory cigar. I mean, we have one after every show, but it does feel a little premature. He pulls out his lighter and then steps out of the car. He peers down the line, but it's too dark to see. Then he hears the rumble of the train in the distance, sees the outline, rows of glowing lights rushing toward him. Panic rises up in his chest. He hits the radio and squeezes the button. A faint sound of static is audible. It's here. Do you read me? Silence. As the train bears down, Reynolds screams into the walkie. This is it! This is it! This is it! He's barely said the words when a deafening whoosh envelops him. For a few terrible moments, he watches as the train speeds along the track. Then he hears the crackle of static. In the distance, a pinprick of red appears the glowing light of the stop signal. He hears the grinding of the train's brakes. A wave of euphoria hits him. Jumping into the car, he grabs the walkie. Attack crew, get ready! Now the countdown has begun. There's no more room for error. Three a.m. Sears crossing. Goody hurries along the railway line, his path lit by a bright full moon. He creeps to the front of the train, edges himself up and peers into the cab window. Smiles as he sees the driver's puzzled expression. He glances back at his waiting crew. As soon as I'm on board, separate the engine and money car from the rest of the train. Goody's hand shakes as he reaches for the cab's door handle. The driver is bigger than he expected. He hopes he can take him with his back turn. But as he steps inside, the door swings shut with a bang and the driver spins round. For a moment, they eye each other in surprise. Then, the driver lunges. Goody raises a wooden club. Don't be a hero! He forces the driver to the ground and gestures for Pop, a retired train driver, 
to approach the controls. He pushes his doubts about Pop to the back of his mind. Yeah, exactly. I would say now is a moment to put any of your concerns aside. Pop hobbles over and starts jabbing at various buttons. OK, but also maybe trust your instincts. His wrinkled eyes widen in panic. His voice is full of fear. Uh, I drove a steam train. This is a diesel. It's not the same. Goody feels his stomach lurch. A fucking steam train? Reynolds promised he was the man for the job. Goody looks in disbelief as Pop again scrambles at the controls. Ahead, the track disappears into darkness, down to where the rest of the team is waiting, ready to unload the loot. Goody hears Reynolds' voice crackle over the radio. Will someone get this bloody train moving? We're falling behind schedule. Goody feels his entire body tense, but he doesn't have the time to dwell on Reynolds' fucker. Pushing Pop aside, he hauls the original driver to his feet. Get this thing moving, or you're a dead man. But the driver fixes Goody with a defiant glare. Goody raises his wooden club. We can do this the easy way, or the hard way. The driver's eyes flick nervously to the club. Finally, his hands move to the controls. Goody exhales as he hears the engine roar to life. The train jerks forward. He needs to get this train to the bridge, and fast. Nothing will keep him from his money. Not even Reynolds' second-rate cat-handed crew. Fifteen minutes later, Sears crossing. Reynolds watches as the train and its single carriage glide to a halt. The train should have arrived at its next stop by now. Its absence will already have been noted. He steps forward and points at the single carriage behind the engine. Smash those doors open! The sound of breaking glass cuts through the still night. Two of the gang wriggle through a broken window. From inside, there's raised voices, the occasional thud. Then silence. Finally, the large doors slide open to reveal four postmen lying on the floor, hands behind backs. The wire cage full of money sacks hangs open. Reynolds barks orders. Get information! Nine minutes to empty it! The crew form a chain, from the carriage down the embankment to the vehicles on the road below. Soon, a stream of sacks is flowing downhill into the open doors of the Land Rovers. Standing back, Reynolds feels his chest expand. He walks along the line, counting off the minutes, offering words of encouragement. After nine minutes, he raises his arm. That's enough! Time's up! In the carriage, he can see more sacks. He feels a knot in his stomach at the thought of how much they'll be leaving behind. As we'll remember from Hatton Garden, it would be so difficult to walk away when there was still money in there because you've put so much time and effort into planning this. You're actually at the moment where your hands are on the cash, but you know you have to stick to the plan. As the line begins to break up, Reynolds hears Goody shout, Wait! Stay where you are! There's only five bags left! Reynolds feels a flush of irritation. Goody knows the plan better than anyone, and the risks. He feels the eyes of his men on him. Goody turns and glares at him. We've still got time! That's our money on that train, not just yours! Reynolds knows opportunities don't come any bigger than this. But he knows it's not daring that has got them this far. It's discipline. Goody eyes him defiantly. But Reynolds isn't backing down. He takes a step forward, fists clenched. We stick to the plan. Get in the car now! Goody shifts on his feet, looks at the floor, then turns and skulks off to the cars. As the rest of the men descend to the waiting vehicles, Reynolds pushes his anger aside. Whatever is going on with Goody, he'll deal with it later. Right now, all that matters is getting the money and the crew to safety. Half an hour later, Aylesbury. Reynolds squints beyond the Land Rover's bouncing headlights as he leads the convoy along winding lanes. He anxiously scans the landscape for signs of police. He knows it's dangerous to still be out on the roads. The alarm will have been sounded by now. Eventually, he pulls into the safety of the dirt track leading up to Leatherslade Farm. 
Outside the farmhouse, the men silently ferry Sachs inside. In the kitchen, Reynolds turns on a police scanner. Through the static, he can make out urgent chatter. Then the frantic voice of an officer cuts through. You won't believe this, but someone's just stolen the train. The officer's words hang in the air for a second. Then the room erupts into raucous cheers. Four hours later, Reynolds sits at a table stripped to his vest. Great burglar, bad strip poker player. Around him, the farmhouse is a maze of money. Thick bundles cover every surface. They've been counting for hours. Reynolds leans back and closes his eyes. He imagines Franny's reaction when she sees the hall. Feels proud that his family will never go without again. Throughout the morning, news bulletins have been reporting on the robbery. Earlier, a solemn-voiced newsreader described it as a crime that strikes at the heart of the establishment. Reynolds hears Goody calling from the living room. Reynolds sighs. Goody's been frosty since their return. He's unsure what to expect as he heads in, but, to his surprise, finds Goody with a large grin plastered across his face. He's standing in front of a wall of neatly piled money towers. Reynolds can't help but break into a grin himself. Go on, then. Goody grabs two stacks of cash and sends them fluttering through the air. Two million six hundred and thirty thousand seven hundred and eighty-four quid! We bloody did it! Jesus, that is a lot. In today's money, that's around forty-one million (gasps) pounds. Stop! You'd let yourself have one throw in the air, wouldn't you? Corks burst from bottles and foaming champagne showers the room. Reynolds estimates it's around £140,000 per man. It's more than most people earn in a lifetime. An overpowering feeling of satisfaction grips him. It's more money than he ever dared imagine. As the men drift off into the other rooms, he and Goody are left alone. Reynolds thinks back to their exchange at the bridge, decides to clear the air. But before he can, another news bulletin begins. Police are searching for a set of army Land Rovers they believed were used in the robbery. Reynolds feels panic rise up through his body. Land Rovers? But then he recalls the train driver watching from the cab window. He feels his stomach turn. The bloody train driver. What was he even doing there? Anger overtakes him. He turns and scowls at Goody. That fucking driver! He should have been tied up with the others! Goody's face contorts with outrage. He spits out his words. This is on you. Your geriatric train driver couldn't drive a fucking diesel train. Reynolds turns to the window, sees the Land Rovers in the yard. He wonders if the neighbouring farmer also saw them. In the distance, the first wash of daybreak is emerging over the fields. With the police on the lookout for their vehicles, they can't risk using them and they have no other form of transport. With a jolt, it dawns on him. These men, this group who have just pulled off one of the biggest heists in British history. They're sitting ducks. Hey everyone, this is Freddie Prinz Jr. and I want to invite all of you to listen to my new podcast, That Was Pretty Scary. Join me and my co-host John Lee Brody as we rewatch and review every horror movie we've ever seen. Trust me, it's a lot. We'll talk about how some of the most iconic monsters were created and break down all the techniques filmmakers use to try and scare us. If you have a love for horror films or even enjoy old Hollywood stories, this podcast is for you. So join us both as we take you through our favorite horror films. We cover everything from blockbusters like Scream to classics like Psycho to my very own I Know What You Did Last Summer and even some films from the B-movie universe like Killer Clowns from Outer Space. John and I will bring you horror films from all over the globe. Follow That Was Pretty Scary wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. August 8th, 1963, 1pm, Leatherslade Farm. Goody stalks through the farmhouse, his mind whirring. He can't believe he let Reynolds talk him into staying put at this farm. He needs to come up with a solution, and fast. In the kitchen, a game of Monopoly is underway. 
Cigar smoke shrouds the board. Men roar with laughter as they spread piles of real money out in front of them. It would be such a strange atmosphere in this house, sort of looking forward to your new future life as a millionaire, but also realising that you've just got this last hurdle to get over, which is quite a major one. Also, the most perilous game of Monopoly in British history. Monopoly with real money with train robbers. Do you think it would be an awkward silence when somebody had to go to jail? <laughs> They'd all be like, oh, it's the elephant in the room. <laughs> a bit close to home. Should we just cover that part of the board up? And, yeah. <laughs> the jubilant atmosphere adds to Goody's irritation and fraying nerves. He hears Reynolds behind him, his voice hushed. The police are going to be getting calls about real army vehicles. So we paint ours, disguise them. Tell the men it's a precaution. Goody can't believe what he's hearing. Neither can I, really. Do they think that the police would be so stupid as to be like, well, there's three Land Rovers, but they've got a very patchy lick of white paint over the top. Maybe he thinks that camouflage really works at close (laughs) range. Goody steps out into the yard, breathes deeply. The warm air carries the sharp smell of hay and manure. Reynolds follows him, urgency in his voice. We just need to stick to the plan, Gordon. Nothing has changed. Goody spins round, bristling. Don't be stupid, Bruce. Everything has changed. How is hand-painting a bunch of Land Rovers going to help? Either way, they're useless. Just like your driver who got us into this fucking mess. I don't know why I'm in the mind of Goody all the time, but I tend to agree. Like, that's just not going to do anything, and what a waste of time. Also, if I was Goody, I still would be annoyed about Pops. Look, the thing about Pop is he did his best, OK? He brought great energy to the group. And yeah, he didn't know what he was doing. Does not matter? Alice, this isn't an under-sevens five-a-side team. <laughs> Reynolds steps forward. I've made you a rich man. Don't you forget it. Goody laughs in his face, his blood stewing. I'd be even richer if you didn't insist on leaving half the loot in the fucking train. Fuck this! Goody storms back towards the kitchen, listening to the laughter emanating from the room. Reynolds grabs hold of his arm. Let me go, Bruce. They need to know. Reynolds holds his gaze, still clutching Goody's arm. We plan to stay for a week. No movement. Avoid drawing any attention. So that's what we'll do. Their standoff is interrupted by the chimes of a news bulletin on the radio. They both fall silent as the announcement echoes through the house. Police investigating the post office train robbery have begun searching properties within a 30-mile radius of the crime scene. Reynolds' mouth falls open at the latest development. Goody pulls his arm out of Reynolds' grasp and glares at him. I've had enough of this shit, Bruce. That's it. Goody pushes past him into the kitchen. His stricken expression causes the men to fall silent. The police are sweeping the area. Going door to door. Chairs clatter to the floor as men jump to their feet. Across the room, Reynolds hangs his head in resignation. I say we get out of here. Who's with me? Goody hears murmurs of agreement. The room turns to Reynolds, who nods. This place is crawling with prints. If we're cutting out, first we remove any sign we was ever here. Goody's mind races. They don't have time for that. He can't rely on Reynolds anymore. It's time to take matters into his own hands. Better than that, we burn it to the fucking ground. That's quite an extreme solution, isn't it? And I don't know anything about this, granted, but you would imagine that would draw some attention from, say, police who are doing a 30-mile radius sweep of the area. And anyone who can see rising flames (laughs) from a huge farm. You don't need to be a pro to know that that's bad. The next day, August 9th, 1963, 7am, Brill, Oxfordshire. Reynolds makes his way along the narrow country lane. Emerald green hedgerows burst with life in the early morning sun. On his shoulder, a holdall bulges with almost £150,000. That's a heavy old bag on your back, isn't it? It is, but he must have felt on top of the world at that moment. British summertime. I actually think there are very (laughs) few... British summertime... The days are long, you've got two million on your back and you just got the world at your feet. Without sounding like a dozy patriot, <laughs> this country smells amazing during the summertime. I think he's just smelling burning probably at this point. <laughs> Reynolds is walking seven miles to Tame to meet his friend Mary. 
There, he'll hide his money in the back of a removal van, which she'll drive to London. Reynolds will take the bus. After an hour of walking, his bag hangs heavy on his shoulder. He's still miles from Tame. From behind, he hears the hum of a car engine. Without turning, Reynolds sticks out an arm, thumb in the air. To his surprise, he hears it slow down. Spinning round, Reynolds' eyes widen in panic as an army jeep pulls to a stop. No! Inside, two officers eye him quizzically. Reynolds' blood roars in his ears as one with a clipped white moustache addresses him. Where are you heading? Reynolds tries to sound relaxed. Uh, time? The officers exchange a look. That bag looks heavy. You'd better get in. As the jeep takes off at speed, Reynolds feels the money settle in his lap. The officer addresses him. I suppose you heard about that train business? Reynolds nods. In the rearview mirror, the driver glares at him. Their eyes meet. It was on the radio while I was at work. Reynolds feels as if he's saying too much. He tries to ignore the driver's eyes watching him in the mirror. Uh, What exactly do you do for work, Mr...? Reynolds' mind races. He can't read his tone. The name's Walker. I, um, I deal in antiques. What? Of all the things? (laughs) What do you mean, as if that's what you'd say? Reynolds feels the car slow down. He grips the hold all, glances around for the door handle. The car stops and the driver turns, levels his gaze. Here you are, Mr Walker. Tame. Getting out of the car, Reynolds breathes a sigh of relief. Later, Reynolds boards the bus to London. Walking down the aisle, a sea of newspapers stretches out before him. He stares in disbelief. Every front page carries a story on the post office train. Dropping into his seat, he realises the whole country is talking about the job. But from the headlines, it's clear the press and police have no idea who's behind the robbery. He just hopes it remains that way. The farm should already be up in smoke. He feels himself relax for the first time. The energy leaves his body. He just wants to see his wife and kid. As the coach pulls out, he pictures Franny's face, allows himself to trust that everything is going to be fine. I think so too. Do you really? Well, in this moment, I'm like, what are they going to find? What evidence is there to pin it on him? Wouldn't it be nice if there was one series of British scandal where we went, he believes everything's going to be fine, and then that was it. So more like a CBB's bedtime story? I'm Matt Ford. I'm Alice Levine. Na na. <laughs> The same day, 3pm, Putney, London. Goody fumbles with his key until the door swings open. He hoists two bulging suitcases into the small Victorian semi. He's relieved to be back in London. He was the last to leave the farmhouse and he's had to catch two buses to get here. He's been on edge since he left and now he's exhausted. Inside, he closes the curtains and unzips the cases pulls wads of cash out and spreads them across the carpeted floor. He lies back, holds a fistful of notes above his head and lets them cascade around him. The sound of the front door latch makes him sit bolt upright. He scrambles on all fours, tries to sweep his money under the sofa. Seconds later, his mother's head appears around the living room door. He breathes a sigh of relief, gets to his feet as she throws her arms around him. My God, Gordon, I've never seen so much money! Goody swells with pride. What are you going to do with it all? Goody realises that in all their months of planning, he's never considered what he'd do if they were successful. Concealing such a large amount of money won't be easy. As his mother puts the kettle on, he finishes gathering up the cash. Right now, the money isn't his main concern. In the rush to leave the farm, no one would agree to stay behind to torch it. Oh, for God's sake! The risk of locals spotting someone at the scene was too great. Goody destroyed what he could on a bonfire. Uniforms, maps, anything that might have fingerprints. He knows it's not enough. He needs to finish the job. Later that evening, he hurries along the banks of the River Thames and ducks into the Spanish Steps pub in Canning Town. A contact has put him in touch with an insurance scammer. 
it should be the perfect foil for what he needs to ask. In the dim interior, he peers through a fog of cigarette smoke. He sinks onto a wobbly stool opposite a man with beady eyes. The man appears to be a good few beers deep. Goody clutches an envelope full of money in his lap. The man swills the dregs of his pint. Another pint? Goody eyes him warily. He doesn't want to leave his fate in the hands of a drunk. I'm a safe blower by trade. Torching a farm will be a piece of cake. Goody is momentarily taken aback by his directness. He takes a beat. I need it done tonight. Goody peels a wad of cash from the envelope, thrusts it under the table. Seems like you might be in a bit of a bind, Sam. The man leans back, his watery blue eyes glinting. Goody's throat tightens as the man continues. I don't need details. What I do need is double what you're offering. And up front. He considers walking away, but the man's right. He is in a bind. The police are circling and the farm is currently one giant evidence locker just waiting to be found. He can't take the risk. I don't have that cash on me at the moment. Look, I ain't here for fun. The price has just gone up. It's now triple. Goody feels his skin crawl. He takes out an extra wadge of cash and stuffs it into the envelope. Double. Take it or leave it. The man reaches under the table and takes the envelope from Goody's grasp. A look of glee in his eyes. Goody feels sick. The man gets up and leaves. Consider it done. Goody orders a drink, tries to clear his head. He's given the man detailed instructions about the farm. All he can do is hope he sticks to his word. You've just given a random drunk man in the pub thousands of pounds in cash and then just gone, yeah, he'll do what he said, won't he? What could go wrong? Three days later, a transport cafe on the North Circular, London. Reynolds turns up his collar and swings out of the car door. Light rain peppers his suit as he dashes up the steps to the cafe. He joins Goody at a corner table. He's not seen him since the farm. On the table, a newspaper headline reads, £250,000 looted in world's biggest hijack. The crime is already taking on mythical status. There's been round-the-clock reporting in newspapers, radio and television. That morning, details about the rigged signal were released to the press. They're being hailed as criminal masterminds. Goody strikes a match, leans his cigarette over the flame, sends smoke pluming across the table. When he speaks, his voice sounds cold. I don't know how to say this. The farm wasn't torched. I found out this morning. Weirdly, the drunk insurance scammer who extorted me in a pub didn't actually do a very diligent job. How was I supposed to know? How are you supposed to know? Reynolds catches his breath. Anger seeps into his voice. The one thing I asked? Heads turn at Reynolds' raised voice, but Goody doesn't react. His voice is tight. I'm upset too. I gave clear instructions. Reynolds can't believe what he's hearing. Instructions? I left instructions for you! Goody leans forward. Stops inches from his face. You mean when you skipped out? Reynolds inhales deeply, tries to focus. He fixes Goody with a defiant stare. Then we go back and finish the job ourselves. No, surely not. Alice, this is British scandal. I know, but I forget every time. Two hours later, it's pitch black and deathly silent. Reynolds is about to pull into the narrow lane leading to the farm when Goody suddenly points to a dim blue light on the horizon. Reynolds slows the car and squints at the light. He can't make it out. Then he feels his stomach lurch as he hears the faint ring of sirens. He pulls the car to the side of the road. It's the fucking police! We're too late! Reynolds thinks of the petrol in the boot. He wonders if they could still sneak in destroy what's left. He backs up and rejoins the main road. 
Half a mile later, he kills the engine. They cross a field on foot, follow the tree line overlooking the farm. As they get closer, they see more lights, hear voices. They crouch at the boundary hedge, see the farm lit up with floodlights. The farm is swarming with police. It's too late. They've missed their last chance. Reynolds' heart races as he watches a line of police carrying boxes out of the house. He shoves Goody in the chest, growling under his breath. You fucked us! I delivered everything on a plate and you've got us nicked! Goody looks up at him, anger flashing across his face. I've got us nicked! Don't you fucking dare pin this on me, Bruce! Goody stands up, looming over Reynolds, points an accusatory finger at him. We should never have stayed put at that farm. That's on you. Reynolds rises to meet him. He looks down his nose at Goody, sneering into his face. If you'd stuck to the fucking plan, we wouldn't be in this mess. Goody erupts, grabbing fistfuls of Reynolds' shirt and spitting the words at him. I'm fucking done with you, Bruce. Do you hear me? Done. As Goody storms away, Reynolds catches his breath looks up at the night sky and the blue lights reflecting on the low clouds. He's hit with a realisation that he can't rely on anyone anymore, not even Goody. He needs to look after himself and his family. He just hopes there's nothing in the farm that leads the police to his door. August 14th, 1963, Esmeralda's Barn, London. Goody's eyes follow the roulette ball rattling around the wheel. Beside him, his fiancée Patricia nervously fingers a stack of plastic chips. After a steady run of wins, Goody has gone all in. Anything to take his mind off Leather Slade Farm and what the police might find there. As the ball comes to a rest, the croupier shouts the result. Black 21! Goody falls back in his seat. Bollocks! As the croupier scoops up his chips, Goody drains his whiskey, pulls Patricia close and smears her cheek with kisses. Don't worry, there's more where that came from. Poor Patricia. Put her in the poor plus ones pile. At the bar, he orders a bottle of champagne, surveys the casino. As he reaches for the ice bucket, he feels a hand on his shoulder. Still a gutsy bastard, I see. Goody turns to see the round, beetroot red face of his old associate, Terry. Is he single? It's been years since he last saw him, before Terry was sent down for armed robbery. His once long hair is now worked into a farcical comb-over. I'll be drowning my sorrows and all if I lost that bet. Goody affects a cheery tone. (laughs) You know me, Tell. Easy come, easy go. The little nervousness I have about this banter is that at some point, someone will be driven to show off. People can't help themselves in British scandal stories. Goody introduces him to Patricia. Soon, they're reminiscing about old times. How you doing, Terry? Terry sighs, runs his fat, bejeweled fingers across his scalp. Not getting any younger, and money's tight. Then he adds with a chuckle. (laughs) Don't suppose you know any of those train robbers? Goody is caught off guard. Come again. Haven't you heard? The reward for information is a quarter of a mil. So you'd get nearly double for dobbing them in than you would have got as your share of the haul? Pays to be a grass. I feel like that's not by coincidence. So rather than presuming that someone outside the group would know, this is targeted at someone inside the group to make them grass. And these guys aren't best mates. These are all just like random men put together because they needed so many people. Goody feels the ground tilt beneath him. Did he hear that right? It's more than he made doing the job. He pastes on a smile as Terry continues. Every bent bastard in London wants to know who blagged it so they can collect. That reward could be my pension. Terry's eyes linger on the champagne. Goody's expensive new suit and jewellery. Of course, maybe you don't need the money. Before he can respond, Patricia is on her feet. She wraps Terry in a warm hug. It was so nice to meet you. If we don't leave now, we'll miss our dinner reservations. As they make a hasty exit, 
Goody's mind is reeling. With a bounty that size, every grass in London will be out for them. It's not the police he needs to watch out for, it's his associates. It's time to disappear, but first, he needs to warn Reynolds. The same day, Putney, London. In the hallway of his home, Reynolds presses the phone to his ear, pinches the bridge of his nose. On the other end, Goody is talking a mile a minute, and as Reynolds listens, a cold, creeping dread takes hold. I know people who shop their own mothers for that dough. London ain't safe, Bruce. Before he hangs up, Goody says he's considering going abroad. I've got a mate in Spain who could put me up. Lowering the receiver, Reynolds hears the sound of tearing paper. He heads to the living room. His son, Nick, shrieks with delight as he unwraps the train set Franny bought earlier. Bit on the nose, isn't it? Franny hoists Nick into the air. Look, here's Daddy! Reynolds hugs them tightly. He feels an overwhelming surge of love. The thought of them being targets for any lowlife looking to get rich is too much to bear. He has to protect them, and that includes shielding Franny from the truth. Franny peels herself free and grabs a copy of Vogue. Do you think I'd suit short hair? What about blonde? Reynolds passes Nick back to his wife and moves to the drinks cabinet. He pours himself a large whiskey. Thinks changing their appearance isn't a bad idea. I do as it happens. You'd look like Diana Dawes. Franny smiles coyly. She tickles Nick, cooing as he giggles in her arms. Seeing Franny's devotion to their son, Reynolds feels a pang of shame for what he's about to do. Reminds himself it's for their own good. He sets down his drink, wraps his arms around her waist. I've got another surprise. I'm taking you on holiday. Franny groans. Oh, not the caravan. Reynolds laughs. (laughs) A little bit better than that. How about the south of France? Franny is silent for a beat. Then she pulls away, her brow furrowed. Nick's a bit young to go abroad, Bruce. Reynolds feels a knot in his stomach. There's no time to lose, but he can't let Franny know the truth. He keeps his voice playful. I was thinking just the two of us. Nick could stay with your mum. Franny is silent. Now concern shows on her face. You'd tell me if we were in trouble, wouldn't you? Oh my God, this is heartbreaking. Heat prickles across Reynolds' chest. He hates lying to Franny. I just think you deserve a break, love. It'll do us both good. Later, he watches as Franny pulls out their suitcases. She sounds excited. How many nights did you book? He realises he hasn't told her how long they'll be away. In truth... He has no idea. Pack for a week in the sun. He just needs to bide some time. Figure it out. He just hopes he doesn't need longer. Two days later, August 16th, 1963. Côte d'Azur, France. Reynolds lowers his book onto the golden sand and sits up takes in the glittering stretch of ocean before him. Beside him, Franny lies on her back in a bikini. For the first time in forever, his body feels free of tension. Two days with no news updates. It's like a weight has been lifted off him. In the distance, a speedboat cuts across the bay. He turns to Franny, runs a hand across her thigh. Would Madam care for a drink? She smiles but doesn't move. Coca-Cola, please. Garçon. Reynolds crosses the beach. Paunchy men with white hair sweat beside sun-kissed beauties. He's in the playground of the rich and he wants to stay forever. A boy darts past with a bucket full of seawater and he thinks of his son. He's staying with Franny's mother back in London. Reynolds determines to bring him when the heat dies down. Use the money to give Nick the childhood he never had. In the shade of the thatched beach bar, Reynolds perches on a stool. A few seats along, two men are speaking in English. One of them catches his eye. Does a double take. 
Reynolds tells himself it's paranoia, focuses on the menu. He orders his drinks, then turns to lean against the counter. With growing dread, he watches the man stand and walk toward him. Hears him call out. Do I know you? The man draws nearer. His bleary eyes locked onto him. Words slurred. I know who you are. Reynolds's heart pounds. The warm air suddenly feels oppressive. He edges away. But the man leers toward him, swaying. You're Michael Caine, ain't ya? Relief floods through Reynolds. His chest heaves with laughter. The other man looks bemused. It's not the first time he's been told he looks like the actor. <laughs> Pleased to meet ya! On the bar, a Daily Express is littered with peanut shells. As they chat, the front page catches Reynolds' eye. He moves closer, tilts his head, then freezes. Through the shells, he can make out the headline, Arrest made in hunt for train robbers. No, who? Below, a photo stares back. It's Roger Cordry, the head of the South Coast Raiders. Reynolds feels the strength leave his legs. He leans against the bar. Cordry is a direct line back to him. If Cordry talks, everything he's worked so hard for is gone. He pictures Nick back in London, alone and vulnerable. He stands up abruptly, the stool clattering to the floor behind him. His new companions ask if he's all right, but he stumbles away from them wordlessly. The world spins and blurs around him. All he can think about is getting Franny and Nick to safety. He starts running towards Franny, who stops applying sun lotion with an alarmed expression. Bruce? What's wrong? Lying to Franny was a mistake. Reynolds is going to have to come clean. It's time to return to London, pick up Nick and leave the UK for good. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the second episode in our series, The Great Train Robber. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read... The Great Train Robbery, Crime of the Century by Nick Russell Pavier and Stuart Richards and The Autobiography of a Thief by Bruce Reynolds. I'm Alice Levine. I'm Matt Ford. Jack McKay wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our managing producers are Tonja Thigpin and Matt Gant. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louie for Wondering.